Octavio Paz, the Mexican Nobel laureate, a cultural icon, a poet beyond praise, came to India and the result was a fascinating discourse on India's landscape, culture and history. On a morning of November 1951, Baz arrived in Bombay and his first encounter with picturesque India was the Gateway of India. An arc of stone planted on a dock and crowned with four little towers in the shape of a pine tree. It seemed to him the fantasy version of Roman arches. Behind the monument, floating in warm air, was the Taj Mahal Hotel. To him, it was an enormous cake. Someone explained that the strange appearance of the Taj, front facing the city and back turning to the sea, was due to a mistake. But to him, the mistake seemed deliberate, an unconscious negation of Europe and the desire to confine the building forever in India. The streets of Bombay, for him, it was an unimagined reality of India. Huge buildings colored red and gray, a nightmarish Victorian London, the bustling streets, people on foot daring the torrent of cars, rivers of bicycles. The wave of heat matched the waves on roads. Crowded markets he had seen, heard, smelt and felt nausea, dizziness, horror, astonishment, joy, enthusiasm, inescapable attraction during his interface with India. For his second interface, Baz returned to India in 1962 as the Mexican ambassador. His official residence in Delhi became a meeting point of writers, painters and intellectuals. In the same house, under the neem tree of which Baz has talked so many times, he married his love, Mary Jo's, and started his second life. During his Indian sojourn, Baz visited monument to monument, destination to destination. For him, it is attractive and sensational. Qutub Minar, symbol of Delhi's Islamic architectural wonder, stands alone in a majestic manner, a monument dedicated to the conquest of Delhi by the slave dynasty in the 12th century. Moved by the imposing structure of Qutub Minar, Paz writes, a rare combination of the height, solidity and slender elegance is what the Qutub Minar is. The reddish stone, contrasting with the transparency of the air and the sky, gives the monument a vertical dynamism like a huge rocket aimed at stars. It's a victory tower, deeply rooted in the ground, that unbendingly ascends a prodigious stone tree. Baz was immensely impressed by the serene beauty of Humayu's tomb, and he thought no less beautiful but more serene, as if geometry had decided to transform itself into running water and columnades of trees that is the mausoleum of Emperor Humayu. For him, it was a combination of multicolored expanses and avenues of sand, bordered by palms. Paz dedicated this poem to this mausoleum. High flames of rose, formed out of stone, and air, and birds. Time in repose, above the water, silences architecture. Lodi Gardens, 
one of the finest examples of Mughal gardens, Baz's experience in Lodi gardens is reflected in this verse. There is nothing terrifying in these tombs. They give the sensation of infinity and pacify the soul. The simplicity and harmony of their forms satisfy one of the profound necessities of the spirit. The longing for order and love of proportion. One of the great attractions of these buildings is that they are surrounded by gardens. The quest for exploring the religious, cultural mosaic of India led Baz to the tombs of Amir Khusro and Nizamuddin Olia in Delhi. Fond of Sufi devotional music, he often visited these dargahs. Baz's tribute to the master and his disciple is reflected in these lines. Tombs, two names, their stories. Nizamuddin, the wandering theologian. Amir Khusro, the parrot's tongue. The saint and the poet. A grim star sprouts from a cupola. Slime sparkles in the pool. Within myself, I crowd myself. In my own self, I press myself. As I crowd myself, I overflow. I am extended and I expand. The full one spilling and filling myself. Mathura, the birthplace of Lord Krishna. Paz visited Mathura in 1952 and stood witness to interesting rituals on the banks of the river Yamuna. The songs of the priests, the little candles floating for a few minutes before being swallowed by the night. face of the Indian and Latin American souls goes beyond the literary circles. The Bhakti cult, a part of the Indian philosophic tradition, has reached the shores of Latin America. Hundreds of devotees throng the Ishkan Center in Chile. They revere Lord Krishna and Radha and abandon their souls to the tune of the devotional songs. About his visit to Curzon Museum in Mathura, Paz writes, I was simply seduced by the statues of the Yakshis, their companion and consorts. The Yakshis, the graceful and sensual nymphs of Hindu mythology. I trembled before the red, decaptivated statue of Kanishka, the warrior king. No one behind, no one ahead. The path the ancients cleared has closed. And the other path, everyone's path, easy and wide, goes nowhere. I am alone and find my way. The place that first heard the preachings of Buddha, where the wheels of Dharma started rolling, the sermons still have its echo in the stupas and the remnants of over 1,500 years of monastic tradition. His famous poem, Sunyata, is a tribute to Nagarjuna.
हनुमान हनुमत हनुमत Octavia Paz came to Galta in 1963 in quest of the secret behind one of the most important characters of Hindu mythology Lord Hanuman Here he met with one of the saints an ardent devotee of Lord Hanuman who explained to him various facets of Lord Hanuman including his great intellect The encounter went a long way in shaping his thoughts which would see its manifestation in the form of a masterpiece in later years El Mono Grammatico or the Monkey Grammarian the immortal creation of Paz depicting aspects of Indian civilization could be an experience covered with pale ashes a sadhu looked at me and laughed watching me from the other shore far off far off paz visited vrindavan another place of pilgrimage and experienced a similar reaction one of the sacred sites of hinduism on the outskirts of mathura celebrated since antiquity by the followers of krishna Thousands of devotees of Radha and Krishna come here to bathe in the river to prove their devotion. Madras, Mahabalipuram, Madurai, Tanjore. These names recur in poems of Paz. Mesmerized by the architecture, beauty of the temples, and the distinct manifestation of Tamil culture, the devotee's performance of traditional rituals made an everlasting impact on Paz. To say in his words, I have mentioned these names as though they were talismans that upon being rubbed bring to life images faces landscapes moments they are a testimony that my education in india lasted for years and was not confined to books Another architectural wonder of South India that drew Paz's attention was Mahabalipuram. It is a grandiose of architecture, the palaces and temples of the Pallava dynasty. These are the same people reaching out to Southeast Asia and creating wonders like the Angkor Wat. The expeditions meant peace and not war for them. In my particular case, I was first drawn to India through an interest in uh, yoga and meditation during the decade of the 60s. Uh, but I very quickly realized that there was a very rich tradition of spirituality. And not only that, uh, something that I find very important, which is a continuity, which uh, you don't find in Latin America, uh, between modern religious forms and very early ones of course there have been changes but there is still a continuity kanyakumari the southernmost point of the indian subcontinent the water rocks and splashes the forming contours of india and river berates the blues all over in the midst stands tall the grandeur of swami vivekananda the monk who drew arches of souls across the five continents amazing sight octavio paz could not dare the temptation sat down and wrote a poem under a new born sky sunk in the mud dumb and shining 
and the invisible. Paz's pilgrimage to India drew a full circle with his visit to the Elephanta Caves in 1985. The sculpture of the 7th century Shivati Caves of the island is one of the most beautiful Indian art. The scenes from the legend of Shiva and Parvati. As a parting tribute to this interface, Paz composed this poem. The beauty of the place has remained a black hole for all distractions and intrusions like an enormous stone in the water. Victoria Ocampo the great lady of Argentinian literature, whose literary work went beyond geographical, linguistic, and cultural barriers. <laughs> Buenos Aires, vibrant and cosmopolitan, most European of all Latin American cities, this city is a quintessential observation of life and landscape in this part of the world. Buenos Aires saw the birth of the eminent writer Victoria Ocampo back in 1890. The universal outlook of modern Argentina germinated to a considerable extent by the attitude of this great lady who threw open her window to the outside world. Victoria's youth was a time of loneliness, to fight, which she sought refuge in a domain of writers. It was during this time Tagore's Gitanjali came into her hands. It moved her deeply, and in 1924, she wrote an essay, The Joy of Reading Tagore. Only a few days after the essay was published, Victoria came face to face with Gurudev. In 1924, Rabindranath Tagore was on voyage to Lima. He fell sick and the doctors advised him to abandon his plan to cross the Andes. He broke his journey and stayed initially at Hotel Plaza. On learning of these developments, Victoria proposed to allow her to play host to Gurudev while he recuperates from ill health. Her invitation was accepted and Tagore moved into the garden villa that she had rented out for him. It was a memory that became indelible in their minds. The sojourn that lasted two months was a time when they exchanged their views and ideas. The encounter resulted in her incessant quest for the Orient. The meeting of minds made her a lifelong friend of India. About Tagore, she wrote, I felt for him great amor de tenderness, a love eternally spiritual. During his stay, the poet penned down 25 poems, all of which are a testimony of the feelings that they shared. To these poems, Tagore gave the name Purabi and dedicated them to Victoria, whom he called Bejoya. Victoria founded the prestigious literary journal Sur which she edited till she breathed her last. She wrote regularly on Gandhi, Tagore and Nehru in Sur. It became a vehicle of expression of Indian thought in Latin American countries. In her words, it was to capture the yonder seas in a small bucket, 
Mansur published several translations of Tagore's literary works in Spanish. Vishwabharti bestowed the title of Deshi Kottam on Victoria for her contribution towards disseminating Tagoriana in the Spanish-speaking world. Sur archives in Buenos Aires are a treasure for ideologists working in Latin America. During her spiritual quest to know India, she got acquainted to Mahatma Gandhi and Pandit Nehru. She wrote about Gandhi, he is a benefactor for my country as well as for his own. He made British dominion in India impossible. Victoria's encounters with Nehru started with the publication of his autobiography. Nehru's letter reaching Victoria immediately after her release from prison marks the beginning of a bond based on admiration. Victoria loved India very deeply, very deeply. And she was a very uh, sensitive people. And then her love for India was personalized in four great figures. Normally, the, th the people think that the uh, love for the India by Victoria was by the way of uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And it's true, but also, and together at the same time, was her admiration, and including her love for Gandhiji. Victoria also maintained a close association with Indira Gandhi, whose personality she was impressed by. On Indira becoming the Prime Minister, Victoria penned down an article from Kamla to Indira. That the most responsible task should fall on Indira, daughter of Kamla, proves what it meant to have a father who treated his daughter as a woman, equal in all respects. Victoria was a major impression on Tagore's life. She ushered the visual artist in him. One day, she picked up scraps of paper that Tagore had thrown while penning his poems. She saw that his corrections were doodles from which emerged exotic forms of life. She convinced Gurudev to take to painting as well. Six years later, when Victoria met him in Paris, Tagore's whimsical playing with doodles had turned into a serious hobby. Later, she arranged for the first ever exhibition of his paintings and drawings in Paris. Yet another facet of the genius opened to the world. Of the exhibitions she recalls, Tagore was as happy as an adolescent who receives an unexpected prize. The bond between Tagore and Victoria was strong and emotional. For 15 years, hundreds of letters were exchanged between Tagore and Pejoya. Just before his death, Tagore expressed his desire to revisit Argentina and he penned down the song, Empty Chair. How I wish I could once again find my way to that foreign land where waits for me the message of love. Her language I knew not. Only her eyes spoke to me. And what they said will forever remain eloquent in its anguish. Beyond Gandhi and Tagore, one can also feel the presence of saints like Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. The Vedantic philosophy explained by them has touched the heart and mind of Latin American people. 
The Ramakrishna Mission in Buenos Aires has become a place of congregation of devotees who visit it for listening to discourses on Vedanta and participating in guided meditation. The interest in Vedanta philosophy in Argentina is historic. Way back in 1912, Sri Ramakrishna's sayings were translated and published in Buenos Aires. Pablo Neruda, a poet, a diplomat, and the 1971 Nobel laureate for literature, is known as Poet of the Masses. Born in a small town of Chile, Pablo Neruda moved to Santiago to train as a French teacher. He started writing poetry at a very young age. In Santiago, Neruda was introduced to Tagore's works and was so influenced that he translated one poem of Tagore in his famous book, The Twenty Love Poems and a Song of Despair. You are the evening cloud floating in the sky of my dreams. I paint you and fashion you ever with my love longings. You are my own, my own dweller in my endless dreams. Neruda visited India for the first time in 1928. The occasion was the session of the All India Congress Committee in Calcutta. He met Gandhi, Nehru, and Subhas Chandra Bose. Later he writes in his memoir, I came to know India when I was very young. I lived with the awakening of her independence. Neruda visited the holy temple of Goddess Kali, the patron goddess of the city of Calcutta and records his experience. The temple of Kali, goddess of death, beside the sacred river of Ganges. Hundreds of devotees across the country have come to win her grace. The Brahmins lift one of the seven veils of the goddess, followed by the blast of gong, loud enough to wake up the dead. Neruda visited Madras and wrote a report narrating his impression of the city. But I would like to celebrate with great words in tunics, the dress worn by Hindu women, which I saw here for the first time. Marina, the pride sea beach of Madras, an exotic ambience. People come here with near and dear ones to breathe fresh air, to break the monotony of the city life. Neruda closely watched the festivals, rituals and the rites of India. He recounts one such occasion. Night, a festival holiday. People have made a long path of burning coal. All at once, a fascinating personage appeared with his face smeared red and white. He starts walking drunkenly over the coal. The magician, unharmed. Then, one more goes over the same span on naked feet. No one is burned. Mm -hmm. 
Niruda came to India again after 20 years. India was now a sovereign republic, the dream of Gandhi. He came as a messenger of Julio Kuri, the world president of Partitions for Peace. In Bombay, he met people like Dr. Raman and Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit and his friend Sardar Jafri. In Delhi, he met Pandit Nehru and delivered a letter by Julio Kuri. He recounts, I was chosen perhaps because of my enduring love for India. Creation of love, architecture, of beauty and of grief, results of noble convergences, silent, dull, eternal, lunar and fantastic, unlimited Maharaja. In a mirror of contemplating water, you are an example of staticness of lines, of whiteness. You open up your exterior, and more than earth, you are a vision of the sky. Niruda had a keen desire to visit Taj Mahal, the epitome of eternal love, and a monument par excellence. The East had a metabolic infiltration in Neruda's idiom and imageries. He took a deep plunge into Indian philosophy and religion, especially Buddhism. On Buddha, he writes, these colossal Buddhas with the feet of giant God, have a smile on their stone faces that is beatifically human, without all that pain, and they give off an odor, not of a dead room, but an odor of vegetable space, of sudden gusts of wind, sweeping down in wild swirls of feathers, and leaves pollen from the infinite forests. Isla Negra is a beautiful place on the Chilean Pacific coast and 120 kilometers from Santiago. This is where Neruda usually stayed and penned his best poems and memoirs and later died here. For him, Isla Negra's wild coastal strip with its turbulent ocean gave him passion to write his new song. Although Neruda always denied the influence of Orient and particularly religion, myth and mysticism of India on his works, one can find his house in Isla Negra and Santiago are adorned with replicas of Buddha, Nutraj, Shiva and other artifacts. Gabriel Mistral, the poetess par excellence of Latin America, was the first Nobel laureate from the continent. She is fondly remembered as teacher of America.
Gabriel Mistral was born in a tiny Chilean village, Vicunia, in the Elkui Valley in 1889. Overlooking the hills and vineyards where she was a school teacher, Vicunia was the center stage of her creative writings. Gabrielle turned writer at a tender age and became the first Latin American Nobel laureate. Love and devotion for children was immense in Mistral. To the cause of infancy and motherhood, she bestowed all her royalties and other ingress. It underlined her philosophy. A happy childhood makes an ideal citizen. Gabrielle Mistral was highly influenced by Sri Aurobindo and Tagore. She discloses, My debt to India is great, in part due to Tagore and in part due to Aurobindo. Tagore awoke the latent music in me. Aurobindo brought me to religion. The highest of mystics, Aurobindo presents the rare phenomenon an exposition clear as a beautiful diamond without confounding the layman. So impressed she was by Aurobindo that in 1950 she proposed his name for the Nobel Prize. Tagore and Aurobindo were to the peak of a mountain, enormous. And they knew each other, they met. And the meeting was extraordinary because both of that they sit one and the other and they were in silence. They didn't speak. That is interesting, the, the wisdom of silence and the knowledge of the silent and the, wor and the word of the silent. And then, <coughs> Gabriela Mistral can be the third person, the, tri the trilogy of wisdom. Two men and, and one woman. It's like a Shiva, Buddha, and Parvati. <laughs> Indian philosophy, Upanishads and Vedas have always attracted researchers and scholars from all over the world and Latin America too has not been left untouched. Dr. Sergio Carrasco, a Chilean scholar who also studied in Jawaharlal Nehru University is totally devoted to Indian studies. He conducts courses and delivers lectures on India in different institutions in Chile. His personal collection of books and journals on India is a matter of envy to any research scholar working on the subject. Cecilia Merrilies, one of the finest voices of Brazilian poetry and perhaps the greatest poetess in Portuguese, since her youth, she was deeply attracted to India. Cecilia Merulis was born in 1904 in Rio de Janeiro, where the sun shines over some of the most beautiful beaches of the world. This colonial capital of Brazil, with its imposing architecture, is one of the most modern cities in the Latin American continent. Born and brought up in a cosmopolitan atmosphere of Rio, Cecilia's exposure to the idea of universal brotherhood is reflected in her writings from the very beginning. Her lyrical harmony represents one of the best organic assimilations of Indian thoughts in the Latin American tradition of literature. In 1953, Cecilia was invited by Pandit Nehru 
to deliver a lecture in the Indian Parliament for a conference on Mahatma Gandhi. That was her maiden visit to India. On that occasion, she disclosed her pungent sorrow on Gandhi's assassination in a poem titled, Elegy Upon Gandhi's Death. You were the only one without guns, without pockets, without lies, unarmed up to the veins, free from the eve and the next day. I have renounced the joyful flowers of my inner dreams. What bounds tied up your heart to mine, so as to make my blood suffer, knowing that yours has been spilled? Merrilies traveled extensively throughout India and captured her reminiscence in an anthology of 60 poems called Poems Written in India. On her Calcutta sojourn, she writes, No Westerner should escape visiting if they do not want to die without having a complete vision of life. Her feelings for the Gurudev Tagore are expressed vividly in these lines. We shall arrive holding hands, Tagore, at the divine world in which eternal love resides. She had also had a, a very strong connection with India since the very beginning. Uh, we examined these books now and you, you showed me that in the, her first book and she was uh, finishing the college at 18. Uh, she wrote, a, she wrote a, a poem uh, named Brahmani which deals with India and all her life after that. On the 20s, on the 30s she wrote lots of articles about Indian especially about Tagore and uh, and Gandhi and about the big Indian poet Sarojini, is that? Yes, she was very fan of Sarojini and all her, all of her life she, she, she had this connection very, very, very uh, impressive within, with, with India. <laughs> Merrily's account of the river Ganges somehow does not reflect the relevance of this great river in India's day-to-day -day life. It finds its true representation in another Latin American poet, Branquia's rendering of his famous poem, Benares. The city gathers through its street and climbs down the steps and bathes in the Ganges. The sun rises. The bath is not a change. It is ecstasy with signs and rituals. Each one creates a path to be united with the infinite. And always shining gods create a polychrome along with the water of the other life. In Jaipur, Merilis was overwhelmed by the fine blend of Hindu-Islamic architecture in and around the Pink City and its exotic ambience. Hava Mahal, the Palace of Winds, or Amber Fort, 
every single thing charmed her attention. Her verses on Hava Mahal have made this wonderful piece of architecture a fame in Brazilian poetry. My goodbyes, fluttering pigeons. My goodbyes, singing nightingales. My goodbyes, gathering clouds. My goodbyes, moons, suns, stars, comets looking at you. Looking at you and leaving. Jaipur. 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 In another Latin American poem dedicated to the architectural marvel of palaces in Rajasthan, in the gardens of the palace, decorated with pure lines, where the green plants spread over their most delicate painting, where hands carving the marble are soft silk, unknown, untiring, anonymous hands often numerous artists protected in time. These hands were there in Jaipur, the pink city, and in all grandeur, Shalimar or Mandor. The hands were there, beautifying the vacuum, achieving that Adelia surprises and scares us. On its explosion without song, India, I see in your numerous hands, which gave life to the dreams. Devoid of cosmic effects of classical dances, the simplicity of folk dances of India acquire a tone, rhythm and color of great visual appeal. It also attracted the curious eye of the Nobel laureates. A melting pot of classical and folk culture, Rajasthan is a mosaic of excellent expressions of folk dances. Kumar, Kalbelia are some of them. Besides saints, writers and poets, the Indian classical music too enthralls the people of Latin America. In Santiago, Mr. Mian Paul Gajardo has formed a musical group called Hindustani. A music graduate from the Benares Hindu University in India, Gajardo's sole purpose is to teach and perform Hindustani classical music across Latin America. From my youth, I was attracted by Indian thought, Indian view of life, Indian philosophy, Indian religion. I was attracted. I think that is because of the past lives. <laughs> and then when I knew Indian music, I decided to know more and to go to India. Yes, yam, samudra, Varanasi, the city of Shiva, a pilgrimage for centuries. The evening Maha Arti on the Ghats of Benares attracts devotees and tourists from all over the world. One of the flavors goes down well with Cecilia Merrily's metabolic assimilation of Indian composite culture and connects her soul with that of India the song of reunion of the souls, Merrily's whispers in the ears of the people of India. Those who know you, admire the path you tread in search of a wise happiness, that happiness, O oh India, 
which is attained through discipline of the soul, which is deep since it is lofty and which is vigorous, soft, alert, firm and diligent so as to be able to subdue me.